in the Lord's house with you all this evening. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Zechariah chapter 4 with me? Zechariah chapter 4. Tonight, as we continue looking in the book of Zechariah together, uh, we've come to uh, one of the more difficult passages to understand in all of Scripture. Uh, and that, uh, even one that has a, a passage, a reference in the New Testament for something that has that, uh, it's uh, fairly difficult to understand in full. Uh, but tonight, I just want us to see that there's a single uh, thread of uh, a teaching that goes all the way through it uh, that we can all, of course, draw from uh, simply and, and understand simply together. And so if you have your Bibles in Zechariah chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse 1. The scripture says, And the angel that talked with me came again and uh, waked me as a man is waked out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon it, of, uh, uh, upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, the seven pipes of the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, uh, answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting and uh, shoutings and crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, unto, uh, said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for uh, the night you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship in your presence. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us of that uh, oil from heaven, the Holy Ghost, uh, so we can do your will. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that can't be with us tonight, uh, that by that same Spirit you would uh, let them know that they have fellowship with us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would go with our missionaries as they uh, do your work in the land that they've been sent to. And Lord, that you'd go with us this week and that you'd give us an opportunity to present the gospel in the places that we find ourselves. Uh, Lord, we pray for our leaders as we always do. Uh, help them to uh, lead according to your will, uh, Lord, that they would be anointed with the oil of gladness, and uh, Lord, that all those around them would see it, and that they'd give God glory because of it. Uh, Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us, and that you keep us safe until the coming of Jesus. And it's in his holy name we pray it all. Amen. So as I said at the beginning, uh, this is one of the more difficult passages to understand, even with uh, a mention in the New Testament of this passage. Uh, but we see that there is a plain thread that runs throughout the whole passage. 
And the first thing I'd like us to see is the vision of the lamp and the olive trees given in verses 1 to 5. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that waked out of his sleep. He, he uh, was at the beginning of the vision. It says that he woke up rather than that he fell asleep and he uh, dreamed as he uh, saw this. This was a waking vision that he had, a vision that God gave him uh, while he was perfectly lucid because of the work of the angel. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In seeing this vision of a candlestick, a, a, a lampstand, uh, with seven lamps on it. Uh, he asks what it means, and it seems that the angel gives a non-answer. Uh, he doesn't describe what is symbolized by the lampstand and the trees at the beginning. And this is because he'll say so later. Uh, he'll be asked a second time at the end of the passage, and he'll say what it is. But right from the start, we already know what this lampstand signifies. It signifies the temple. It signifies the service done in the temple. We know that in the temple, there was a lampstand much like this one with seven lamps on it. In Exodus 37, 17, he made the candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work made he the candlestick, his shaft and his branch, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers were of the same. And in verse 22, their knops and their branches were of the same. All of it was one beaten work of pure gold. And he made his seven lamps and his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. So a, a lampstand in the temple that was to be placed in the holy place before the Lord that had seven bowls for its seven lamps, made of pure gold, just as the one we see in this passage. Though the uh, style of the lamp may have appeared differently in the vision than is described in Exodus, uh, nonetheless, it's plain that this is what is signified, a seven-bold lamp set before the Lord in his temple. And so the vision given is of the service in the temple that was supposed to occur, uh, that the, the priest was uh, to go in and to fill the lampstand with oil so that it can give its light in the holy place before the Lord. And so already at the beginning, we have a, a little inkling about what the passage is about. It's about how God is going to rebuild the temple. He's going to reestablish his presence among his people in the land. In verse 6 again, it says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace, unto it. The first thing he tells us is that the finishing of the temple requires that the Lord be in it, namely that his spirit is working in the midst of his people to bring about this reality. We know that the uh, that uh, oil, olive oil in the scripture is uh, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we know that it was said of Christ in the Psalms that, that he was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. 
that the Holy Ghost needs to be in the building of his temple. The people at that time could not complete the task by themselves. In Ezra 4 verse 4, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahaz, Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So all of the people around uh, Israel uh, stood against them in their building. And this is what's meant by the mountain in our passage. Uh, he says, uh, Oh, uh, what art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof. Uh, the, the people around Israel had stood up against them like a mountain. Uh, they had barred them from uh, doing the Lord's work, building his temple. Uh, they even went out of their way and wrote to the king, and said that they were stirring up trouble, that they were uh, gathering a rebellion. They, had, they slandered the people of God in order to keep them from building the temple. And more than this, they needed the presence of the Lord because without God's presence, there is no temple. Without God's presence, it's just a building. It's just blocks of wood, pieces, uh, pieces of uh, wood and stone. Uh, it is not a temple. A temple is a place where God comes and rules among his people. He rests in his temple. In Isaiah 66, 1, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? The house built for the Lord and the rest of the Lord are one in the same. It cannot be the Lord's house if the Lord is not in it. And this, of course, was seen in the first temple that was built uh, in the days of Solomon uh, when uh, he blessed the temple and, and the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the temple. Uh, it said that the glory of the Lord came onto the temple like a thick cloud so that the priests couldn't worship uh, the, or the, they couldn't uh, go in to serve in the temple. They could only worship from without the temple. Uh, God must come and be in his temple. And so to try and force this by might or by power, by military force, would not work. Uh, they had to have the Holy Ghost. God had to be in it. Otherwise, it would not happen. And God had promised that he would be in it. In Zechariah 1 verse 20, the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. The Lord by uh, the... Uh, use of these carpenters by the uh, motions of the spirit around them, he would cast away all of the people so they could build the city again. In Zechariah 2, 4, And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. That is, his glory would be in his temple. He would dwell with his people in the land there. And so uh, what he's saying here, and what he, he's saying in this, is that the Holy Ghost has to be at the work of building the temple, of restoring God's people to the proper worship of himself. And so it must therefore all be a work of grace. Uh, as we just read, he, he, that Zerubbabel would cry, grace, grace unto it. Uh, that is grace to the temple of the Lord. God himself would come and pull down the mountain that stood against them. The hills melted like wax in the presence of the Lord. 
in the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The Lord would set himself up in the temple. He would lay the cornerstone of the temple. Isaiah 28 verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. This, of course, being emblematic of Christ, uh, a, a type of Christ beforehand. But God would have to build his house, beginning with this cornerstone, that he would deliver to Zerubbabel. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. God would deliver him what he needed to build the temple of God. In verse 8 then, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall be the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. Uh, shall see the, hand, the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They, are the seven. they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Uh, so he simply says that by what he said, by his sending, Zerubbabel would not only begin this work of building the house, but finish the work. And then he says, as we just read, who hath despised the day of small things. We know why he said this. It's because the temple that was being built was smaller than the temple of Solomon. Solomon's temple was a great house. It took the uh, resources built up by both David and Solomon that they had saved up and put aside for building the house of the Lord. And here these who had only just come out of exile were building to the Lord what must have seemed a small shack to worship God in. Ezra 3.12 says, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. Half of the people, the elderly people who had seen the first temple, they cried because they knew that it didn't measure up to the last temple. Uh, even though uh, many of the people shouted for joy, uh, they were dismayed. They thought that this was not worthy of the Lord of hosts. But here he says, who hath despised the day of small things? It might be a small temple. It might just be enough to come and worship God in but God is working in it. God has laid the foundation. He delivered the cornerstone to Zerubbabel. He said that he would be the glory in the midst of them. So what does it matter what the building looks like? God has planted a mustard seed in the middle of Israel, and he will do with it as he sees fit. The uh, Lord has set Zerubbabel to this work, given him a plumb line for it. The Lord run, in his eyes run to and thro, fro through all the earth. He sees how small the building is, and yet he has put his approval on it. Uh, the Lord has uh, allowed this to be done for his glory. And so uh, the uh, bulk of this message given to the people at that time is uh, a hopeful message uh, that God is working. Though it seems in a small way, though in a way that uh, doesn't seem worthy of God, yet he is working. He's building his temple again. And so at the end of the passage, we finally come to the big question. What does the vision of the candlestick, the, the lampstand, and the trees mean in full. We've seen a little bit of what it means 
that the oil pouring out into the lamp signifies that God will build his house, that he will ensure the worship in the midst of it. But what does it mean in full? In verse 11, we're given the answer. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Uh, it's gone through this uh, cycle again. Do you not know what this means? No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. A very, very brief answer to a complicated vision that's given here. There are many different ways of understanding what this means, uh, but I'd like to, to, to put forward what I think the Bible teaches about this. Some think that this is Elijah and Moses. Others think that this speaks about the two offices of Jesus Christ that he came to do on the earth. Others think that this is Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest in those days, who would go about the work of building the house of the Lord. But what I think this is, and it encompasses all of these uh, images, all of these meanings, is that these are those who do God's work to build his house in every generation. Anyone who works and labors in sharing the gospel and pointing men to have faith in Christ, they are accounted as these before the Lord. Whether we count them as representatives of the Jews and the Gentile believers, uh, whether we uh, say that these, this, these are the two witnesses on the last day, whether we say this is Joshua and Zerubbabel at that time, or Jesus who himself laid the cornerstone himself of his church. These are uh, all the people who have God has used to build his house, his people. Revelation 11, 3 tells us and references these two witnesses. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Uh, so the, these two witnesses on the last day, who God will give power to, that is, he will give his spirit to, to do signs and wonders in the midst of the people, that prophesy who are uh, standing before the Lord of all the earth. Uh, these are the last two uh, representatives of the two witnesses before the Lord. Uh, they uh, will go out at the very last, to bear witness to Christ. Uh, they will stand, as it says in uh, Revelation 11, uh, they will stand in the court of God's temple, that is his creation. They'll stand at his footstool and plead with man. Uh, they will call men and women to repentance, uh, striving to build God's temple and finish it. Uh, that's what this is. Uh, that they, being anointed with the Holy Ghost, are the two branches which come off of the olive tree of the Lord Jesus. And they empty themselves out into the temple to do the work of the temple. They give of their own lives at the very end to do his will. That's what these mean in a broad sense. All those who do his will stand before God continually. And this is, of course, exemplified in Jesus Christ himself. As it says in John 3, 34, For he who God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Uh, ultimately, Jesus builds his house, but he lets us have uh, participation in this by the Holy Ghost. 
And so tonight, believers, we have a simple call. We have been called to build God's temple, but we cannot do it by might, nor by power, nor by any wisdom or any craft that we have, but only by the Spirit of God. Let's not neglect to call on His aid as we do His will this week. 1 Corinthians 2.2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I, will, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's exemplify this spirit uh, in our lives this week. Always relying on his power uh, to get done what God's asked us to do. So let's do that this week. And now if there's an unbeliever here. Christ has seen that you have despised the day of small things in your heart. You may think that the church is shrinking, that Christianity is dead. Why would you dedicate your life to a religion that seems more and more by the day to be failing in the West? But I'd like to ask you, what does it matter if the church is small? You despise the hypocrisy of large churches. What does it matter if the church does not have enough to help everyone that she meets? You hate when the offering is taken up. What does it matter if turning from Christ will gain you the whole world in pleasures? You will lose your own soul at the end. In your heart, you have hated this small body of the faithful that God has called out because you hate the one who's called them out, and not for any other reason. John 15, 24 says, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they seen both, uh, have they both seen and hated both me and my Father? But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is sp written in their law. They hated me without a cause. You have hated God without a real cause. Acts 17.30 says to you that the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world by righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. If you do not turn to this man who God has ordained and ask for his righteousness, his forgiveness, then because you have despised the day of small things, because you have lifted yourself up like a mountain over God's household, then he will come and level you in one day. So as the scripture says, I plead with you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, and come and build on the only foundation that can be laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you would do that before it's too late. And again, believers, we've been tasked with a great task tonight, building God's house, carrying forth the work that was started by Jesus Christ on the cross and in the garden when he rose from the dead. I pray that we would all go out in the spirit that he promised to send us and do his work by it, because without him we can do nothing. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for your word. And we thank you for Christ who laid down his life for us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to